The Book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. Jonah's unique among the prophets of the Old Testament because they're typically collections of God's words spoken through the prophet. But this book doesn't actually focus on the words of the prophet. Rather, it's a story about a prophet, a really mean and nasty prophet. Jonah appears only one other time in the Old Testament. It's during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of Israel's worst kings. And Jonah prophesied in his favor, promising that he would win a battle and regain all this territory on Israel's northern border. Now, it's important to know that the prophet Amos also confronted Jeroboam, and through him, God specifically reversed Jonah's prophecy, promising that Jeroboam would lose all of those same territories because he was so horrible. So before the story of Jonah even begins, we are suspicious of Jonah's character. The book of Jonah has a beautiful design with all this literary pairing and symmetry. So you have chapters 1 and 3 telling the story of Jonah's encounter with non-Israelites, first with some sailors and then with Jonah's hated enemies, the Ninevites. And each part offers a comic contrast between Jonah's selfishness and the pagans' humility and repentance. Chapters 2 and 4 contain prayers of Jonah. One is a prayer of repentance, kind of, and the other is a prayer in which Jonah chews out God for being too nice. Now, this careful design of the book is matched by a really unique style of narration. The story is full of all of these stereotyped characters who, ironically, do the exact opposite of what you think they would do. So you have the prophet, the man of God, who rebels and hates his own God. You have the sailors who are supposed to be really immoral, but actually they have soft, repentant hearts and turn to God in humility. You have the king of the most powerful, murderous empire on the planet, and he humbles himself before God because of Jonah's five-word sermon, and even the king's cows repent. This kind of story fits what today we would call satire. These are stories about well-known figures who are placed in extreme circumstances, and they use humor and irony to critique their stupidity and character flaws. Let's just dive in and we'll see how all the pieces work together. The story opens as God addresses Jonah and commissions him to go preach against the evil and injustice in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, Israel's bitter enemy. But instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction, finding a ship going as far west as you can go to Tarshish. Now the big question here is why? Why does Jonah run? Is he afraid? Does he just not like Ninevites? And we're not told yet. So the man of God tries to run from God, and he boards a ship full of pagan sailors. He goes down into the ship, and then he falls asleep. So God sends a huge storm to wake up his prophet, while ironically, the sailors above board are wide awake to everything that's happening. They can discern that there's a divine power at work here. So they throw the dice, and they discover that Jonah, he is the culprit. So they asked Jonah to explain himself, and Jonah spouts off a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. He says, yeah, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the dry land. What a joke, right? God made the sea and the dry land all right, and Jonah's dumb enough to run from this God by getting on a boat? And when the sailors asked Jonah what they should do, he says, kill me, right, by throwing me overboard, which kind of seems noble at first, until you realize this could actually be his most selfish move yet. I mean, what better way to avoid going to Nineveh? So he puts his blood on these innocent sailors' hands by trying to force them to kill him. They're reluctant, of course, and they repent to God even as they toss him over. The storm subsides, and they end up fearing the God of Israel, and unlike Jonah, they actually worship God. But God foils Jonah's plans to escape Nineveh. As Jonah's sinking, God provides this strange, watery tomb for him, the stomach of a large fish. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, this would be certain death. But in this story, everything's upside down. And so Jonah's submarine death becomes his passage back to life. Cramped in the stomach of this beast, Jonah utters a prayer, where he never technically says that he's sorry, but he does thank God for not abandoning him, and he promises that he will obey God from this point on, no matter what. And God's response is quite comic. The whale vomits Jonah back onto dry land. So once again, God commissions Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah complies. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city it would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in, and here is his message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now, his sermon is very short, and it's also odd. 
I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. So God forgives the Ninevites and he doesn't bring destruction on the city. Now, here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah, he's fuming mad, and he utters his second prayer. He first tells God why he ran away back in chapter 1. It was not because he was afraid. Rather, it was because he knew that God was so merciful. And this is great. Jonah actually quotes God's own description of himself from the book of Exodus, and he throws it back in God's face as an insult. He says he knew that God is compassionate and that he would find some way to forgive these horrible Ninevites. You can just hear the disgust in Jonah's voice. Jonah then cuts off the conversation and he prays that God would kill him on the spot. He'd rather die than live with the God who forgives his enemies. Fortunate for Jonah, God doesn't comply and simply asks if Jonah's anger is even justified. Jonah ignores the question and he goes outside the city to camp on a nearby hill waiting to see what might happen happen. You know, the Ninevites might repent of their repentance and get roasted after all. What happens next is very odd. God provides this viney plant to shade Jonah from the sun, and that makes him quite happy. But then God sends a tiny worm to eat up the plant, and so Jonah loses his shade. And there, in the heat of the sun, Jonah asks again that God kill him. So God, again, asks Jonah if his anger is justified, and Jonah barks back, absolutely just let me die. And those are Jonah's last words in the story. God's final words are what concludes the book. He says that this whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah, right? Jonah got all concerned and emotional over this vine, which he only enjoyed for a day. And God asked Jonah, you know, aren't humans a bit more valuable than vines? I mean, isn't it okay if God might feel the same kind of emotion and concern for the city of Nineveh that's full of thousands of people who have lost their way and also their cows? And that's how the book ends, with God asking Jonah for permission to show mercy to his enemies. And what is Jonah's answer? The story doesn't say, because that's not the point. The point is that the book is trying to mess with you. And God's questions here are actually addressed to you, the reader. Are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemy? And so this book holds a mirror up to the one who reads it. In Jonah, we see the worst parts of our own character magnified, which should generate humility and gratitude that God would love his enemies and put up with the Jonah in all of us. And so this strange story actually becomes a message of good news about the wideness of God's mercy that ought to challenge us to the core. And that's the book of Jonah. That's an excellent summary, and he tells it somewhat tongue-in-cheek as he points out the, the satire in the, uh, in the nature of the prophecy. So you've got a visual summary of it. We're going we're gonna to go through it, read a lot of the text itself, and hopefully we can see in this Jesus. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Jonah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, 
in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. You can find this, mark both those places. We'll have them on, on the screen uh, for you to read as well. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read these, uh, which you're going you're to see later, are key verses from the prophecy itself. Jonah 2, 89. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord, or salvation is of the Lord. And we'll talk more about this verse as we go into it. And then Jonah 4, 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Stop a minute. Check your own heart. You call up a name or a face of somebody that you would be resentful if God brought a saving change to them. This is what? It's the inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We're going to break it down tonight and see, turn this diamond of the facets of God's character, His sovereignty, His absolute sovereignty, His incredible mercy, uh, and more things about His nature. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, so you're going to hear some of these things that I'm teaching you that were in the, in the uh, video summary. It's inescapable. It's a small book. Nineveh was to the northeast. Tarshish was to the west. Jonah goes the opposite direction rather than following the call of God because he's a bigot. He does not want to see the Ninevites on the receiving end of God's mercy. Of course, as you just heard in the story, he's tossed into the uh, water and finds himself in the belly of a great wish, a wish, great fish. You know, you see, you read a lot of, uh, I got my whale and fish mixed up there. You see a lot of books that talk about Jonah and the whale. Just parenthetically, it's not a whale. There's a Hebrew word for that. It's a great fish that God had prepared. It's, it's pure speculation to consider what kind of fish it might have been. But uh, he finds himself there. When we get to the end of this, we're going to see where Jesus cites this as a sign. And it appears that Jonah uh, wasn't just biding time in the belly of this great fish. It appears that he actually died, which would come as no surprise to us, and was brought back to life. And you're going to see the significance of that uh, later on in our study. So when you look at a survey of, of Jonah, uh, its message is the messenger. Think about the prophecies we've studied this time. We've had Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Nine prophets we have tried to analyze and put into an order, an understandable order, their prophecies. Some of them multitudinous prophecies, various literature used in their prophecies. When you study Jonah, you're actually studying Jonah, I mean, the person Jonah. His prophecy consists of five Hebrew words. It comes to us, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall perish. And that is the sum and substance of what he prophesies, at least what is recorded that he prophesies. Uh, in the book of Jonah. It's about him. And as I, I agree with what the teachers on the video said, when you, when you boil it down, it's about him, and he becomes a mirror that's held up to us. All right? So <clears throat> you learn a lot about Jonah, not so much about his background, but you learn a lot about his character, the type of person he was. Uh, of all the things mentioned in this book, the storm, the, the, the sailors casting lots, uh, 
the sailors themselves, the, the fish, the Ninevites, the, the plant that grows, the worm that eats it, the east wind that, that makes things very dry and unpleasant. Uh, all of this happens under the sovereign moving of God. One writer I read said, of all these things, only the prophet himself <laughs> fails to obey God. Everything else in the book bows to the sovereign prerogative of God. When, when you divide the book up for, for our purposes, uh, it's two sections. It's the, what we call the first commission of Jonah, chapters 1 and 2, and then the second commission of Jonah. So let's just go through and look at this, at this, uh, this division here. So if I can... to that. In the first commission, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we're told, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, this is different. Go back and think through the historical books we read through. When, when the evil of people comes to, to God in terms of him taking special notice of it, it normally ends, at least it did for the Hebrew children in the wilderness, in a, in a measure of judgment by God. Well, we're told in verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it, to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Here's the first naivety of Jonah. You can't escape the presence of the Lord. The psalmist asks, I think it's in Psalm 139, where shall I go to escape you? If I ascend into the heights, you're there. If I descend into the depths of Sheol, the abode of the dead, you're there. You can't escape God. So he foolishly thinks he can flee from the presence of the Lord. As a result of that, verses 4 to 17 in chapter 1, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. So you have these pagan mariners. They have no thoughtfulness at this point about Yahweh, the creator God, the covenant God of, of Israel. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. In other words, we're all crying out to ours. We're not getting any success. Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a, a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So think, think about this for a minute. These are sailors. They make their living on the sea. They see storms on the sea. This was an unusual storm that terrified sailors. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Casting of lots happens in different ways. Perhaps they had a bowl or a dish or something with with stones all of one color and one of a different color. Sometimes they would actually cast them like dice and you draw. However they did it, if they were playing spin the bottle, the bottle stopped at Jonah. He was, he was clearly pointed out as the problem. They said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? So they're thinking, you're a stranger among us. We typically sail together. Is there something in your background that has angered your God? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear uh, Yahweh, the Elohim of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this you've done? 
Well, the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So we don't have everything in the conversation, but in the course of the conversation, he told them, the reason I'm on this boat is I'm fleeing from God. He, he called me to do something and I didn't want to do it. They said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this greater tempest has come upon you. I know that I'm the, I'm the problem. I'm the reason you're in the mess you're in. And I, I somewhat agree with the, with the video summary. It, it, there appears to be a nobility there. Uh, but ultimately, in, in, jo, in Jonah's mind, if he thinks he can escape the presence of the Lord, if he was doing that, then, if, then he's thinking that death will at least get him out of the assignment, that he won't have to do it. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, now they're calling his name. They were calling on their gods. O Yahweh, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. These, these folks... They, when you read this, you cannot help but be reminded of Nebuchadnezzar when he is brought to his senses. Daniel and cries out, acknowledging God for who he is. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. So they've asked God, please don't, please don't hold us accountable for what we're about to do. And remember, the idea was Jonah's anyway. Then the men feared Yahweh exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to, the, to Yahweh and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, or prepared, some of the translations say. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So opposed was Jonah to the possibility that God might spare the Assyrians of Nineveh that he was willing to take his own life. He basically is asking these people, help me commit suicide. There's a real deep uh, hostility and bigotry toward Jonas. And I will say parenthetically, I've talked to you about this before, that I grew up in a climate in Southeast Texas, in Beaumont, Texas, where there was that kind of hostility toward uh, black people. I don't know if I've told this group this or not, I forget, but there was an older minister who was highly respected otherwise. I remember him saying from the pulpit when I was a child, it didn't sound right, something didn't, that he said in preaching one day, I don't know what he was preaching on, <laughs> that black people do not have souls. It was troubling to hear, but then Karen and I got to had the opportunity to care for him in his, in his last days. I'm sad to tell you that he was a very bigoted man full of hostility toward black men and women. I'm not the judge of his soul, thank the Lord. That's left to the, to the Lord himself. But I mean, I've seen this kind of hostility. And I must confess to you that I grew up with a measure of it climate that I was in. Thank the Lord uh, through the years. He's, uh, he's dealt with my heart about this. But when I read this, this is not far-fetched to me. When I moved pastor First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana, where there were many, and today are very many godly people in that church, we were topping a hill, coming a corner, coming back. Karen and I had gone to uh, get coffee and beignets uh, at a place in Baton Rouge on Sunday night after church. And coming back, I remember turning the corner and there was a cross burning in a yard. Uh, that, I'd seen one before, but it had been a long time. And I said, what is this about? And the, and the man who was driving said, there's a, uh, there's a white woman living with a black man in that trailer and I'm sure someone's making a statement of their displeasure. This is real. Bigoted hostility is real, and we need to make sure that we don't have that. Every now and then, I, 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 
sense the Lord flushing a little remnant out of me when I, when I see some nonsense that goes on in our culture. But Jonah was a very bigoted man. Now, so much so that he's willing to travel 2,000 miles west to Tarshish to avoid uh, doing God's will as it relates to going and preaching to these, these Ninevites. And Tarshish, by the way, if you're trying to get a sense on the map, it would be over in Spain. Okay. But the Lord teaches Jonah, and this will be one of the lessons we look at at the end, that you can't run from him. A friend of mine, Pastor Al Martin, said years ago in a sermon I heard him preach, he said, when, when God gets a man on the line, he was talking specifically about salvation, but it would apply to service. When, the, when God gets a man on the line, using a fishing analogy, he said he may have to sail the seven seas, but he will boat him. If you're a fisherman, you know what that means, to boat that, your catch. He will do it. This great fish is prepared while inside the, the fish, Jonah utters a declarative praise psalm, which alludes to several psalms. I want us to see this. We're going to read the, uh, the section from Jonah. Let's read the psalms first, and then we'll read this. Psalm chapter 3, verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Selah. That, that becomes one of the things he says. Psalm 31, 22. I, said, I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my plea for mercy when I cried for your help. Psalm 42, 7. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and waves have gone over me. In Psalm 69, 1, save me, O God, for the waters have come up, uh, have come up to my neck. So he cries out. It seems to me that uh, he's drowned. He's revived. And when he revives like Nebuchadnezzar, he cries out to God. And then he has vomited onto the shore. Jonah 2 9, but I with the voice, I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So you have the, this episode, the, the first commission, which he disobeys, runs, God arrests him, puts him in the belly of a great fish, has him vomited on the seashore, finally willing to obey God, finally willing to be used by God. So he has this long trek of about 500 miles to get back to where God wants him to be. So he's got some time to think about it, about what he tried to do. So you have this second commission of Jonah that takes place in Jonah 3, chapters 3 and 4. So you pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. In other words, if you tried to travel across Nineveh, it would take you three days, walking all day to get to accomplish it. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In chapter 11 of Luke, verse 30, Jesus teaches, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Remember how Jesus came preaching? The message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you have this, this tone of Jonah, yet 40 days and you'll be overthrown. It's a, it's a call to, it's a warning of what's coming if something doesn't change. And then he may have been saying this over and over, by the way, when you look at the Hebrew. They're followed by a proclamation by the king of the city to fast and repent. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse. 
they will, verse, let's pick up verse 4, then they will cry to the Lord, but He will not answer them. He will hide His face from them at the same time because they've made their de deeds evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against Him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought this is not, my Bible turned over to Micah. I'm sorry, forgive me. I thought this is not what I thought I was reading. Here we go. The people of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed or drink water but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth let them call out mightily to God speaking of the creator now so they picked up Fellows on the, on the ship picked up the idea of Yahweh, Elohim. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster then he, he had said that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And so you have this king who leads the citizens of Nineveh, a massive city from best we can tell from external records. And so he does not do it. Now, so God is determined to show mercy. He's moved and demonstrated his sovereign power throughout this brief prophecy. And you would like to think that Jonah, the prophet, was thrilled to see what was once a pagan people turn to his God, worship his God. And so blinded by his bigotry is he. He becomes angry. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. I read a book like this and I have to stop and ask myself, is there anyone I know who is currently outside the grace of God that I would be content to see stay there and live and die there and perish? And if I find somebody like that in my mind, if I'm just judgment day honest, because the Lord knows my mind, knows my heart. And I need to repent of that. Say, Lord, forgive me. I didn't deserve your mercy. Help me to love creatures made in your image and pray for them to be saved. Jonah's unhappy. Chapter 4, verse 1. He becomes despondent. Look at chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, on the ship... He would rather die than be sent back to Nineveh to preach God's word. In Nineveh, seeing the mighty movement of God, remember the only prophet we have recorded in the Old Testament who sees that. The only thing you can liken it to is Pentecost in the book of Acts. He sees this mighty move of God's mercy, a people repenting to the true and living God. And he is anger, angry. So he let me die. And then Lord, the Lord shows his kindness to him. In chapter 4, verse 6. And we see Jonah experiencing a temporary joy. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah. That it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. I want you to see what's going on here. care for me. God cares for me. He is good. 
if he cares for others that I don't care for, then he's not good. And so, I think God through all of this is, is trying to show Jonah, Jonah's own heart. So chapter 4, verse 8, you see despair again. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. So this is a, this is a refrain from chapter 4, verse 3. It is better for me to die than to live. It is, it is intriguing to me that Jonah got to see what I believe it's fair to say Jeremiah would have given his arm to see. A great movement of God, people turning to God, the great, the weeping prophet Jeremiah grieved because no one listened to his word. No one regarded God. And you can go through the prophets and look at them. They would love to have seen people turn to God. And Jonah sees it. I just want to give you just a sketch real quickly of what we've just gone over so you can maybe get a little better flow. The date for this it's around 760 B.C. We believe there's, like some of the other stuff we've studied, there's controversy about the date. Some folks want to date it in the third century. I think that's way, way late. His first commission, as we mentioned, he finds himself in the great sea, and God, rather than letting him drown and stay dead in this fish, uh, revives him, shows mercy to him. So his disobedience is, I won't go. I won't go. There's a price paid for that. He cries out from inside the great fish. He's delivered onto the, onto dry ground. It's interesting. My God is the God of the sea and the dry ground. And, and Jonah experiences both in terms of God's mercy. Second commission we just looked at, chapter 3 through chapter 4, uh, is not in the great sea. It's in the great city of Nineveh. Just as God showed mercy upon Jonah, he shows mercy upon the people. His response is, I am here. And when God does indeed turn away his wrath and move in a, in a revival mercy upon the inhabitants of that city, Jonah's response is, I shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have come. So God rebukes him. Now, the, the title of this uh, is Yonah, the Hebrew word for dove. The Septuagint, the Greek version, uh, Hellenizes this into the word Yonas, uh, and the Latin Vulgate is used, is the title Jonas. So in the Hebrew, Yonah becomes Jonah to us. The first time we hear about Jonah, as was referenced on the video, uh, we're told uh, in 2 Kings 14, uh, 25, uh, that he restored the border of Israel from Le Le Lebohamath as far as the sea to Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. Um, that's the only other reference in the Old Testament, we have to him. Now, we hear, though, in John's Gospel, a reference, an implied reference to someone like Jonah when they say, in John 7, 52, they replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. How can you be a Galilean and yet claim uh, to have come with the voice of God. We won't go into the, to the, to the, there's a lot of Jewish tradition suggesting who Jonah was, but it's not corroborated by, by the scripture, except to say that, that his, his, what some have called a narrow nationalism, I think that's very kind, 
to suggest that, that Jonah was, had a narrow nationalism. I think he was a, just a full-out bigot. So when you look at trying to date this, I want to give you some, some things to think about that. Some people say, no, this idea that, that God would send a prophet strictly to the Gentiles to preach is a, wouldn't have happened in the time frame. Well, I want us to think about this. First of all, the idea of God's inclusion of the Gentiles in his, in his plan is found elsewhere in the scriptures. Look this real quickly, go through some here. Genesis 9, 27. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be a servant. Canaan being a Gentile land, come to serve uh, the people of God. Come into their, under their watch care. Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was Abram's uh, initial call. God raising him up, giving him a, a, a heritage, a multitude, no man can number, that all the families of the earth, so the Gentiles are included in this call of Abram who would become the father of the Jewish nation. Leviticus 19, the, the holiness code. Verses 33 and 34, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So the idea that, that the Hebrews were to treat non-Hebrews, non-Jews, take them in. 1 Samuel 2.10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt, exalt the horn of his anointed. So the enemies come against God's people will be broken. We're not told that anybody else would be destroyed. Isaiah 2, 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And then Joel, we just came through Joel recently, chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And then here it is, verse 32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So this, this overture, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. So this notion that the idea that God would send Jonah to exclusively Gentile territory to preach, uh, not supported that it would be, a, would be a, a late third century reality. This, since the beginning of time, God has hinted and shown uh, evidence to make his people aware that all nations would be blessed. And so the Ninevites would have been included in that. Secondly, there's, there's some Aramaic words that occur in here. Um, and there are some people that would argue that with the, fact, the fact that Aramaic is used in this, in this book in its original form dates it late as well. No, uh, there are external biblical witnesses that find Aramaic texts uh, as early as 1500 BC, which would be well before the 760 dating that we're suggesting. And the third thing is the fact that the book does not explicitly say that it was written by Jonah. Uh, that's just an argument from silence that people use. We, uh, we don't have any evidence pro or con that. We have to take on face value that it's about him. So people would say, well, even if he preached back at this time, maybe it was written much later. Well, there's no evidence to suggest that. Some people said that the use of the third person style meant there was somebody writing about Jonah, but that's not uncommon for, for people to write in the third person, biblical writers particularly. Of chapter 3, verse 3. Look at this real quickly. Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Nineveh was an exceeding great city. It literally means had become. At the time 
of the story it had become a great, already being a great, very large city. Jonah we know is historical because we read from 2 Kings 14.25 where he's identified there, the same fellow, son of Amittai. So it's not, it's not right to think, well, we're not talking about a historical book. He's a historical figure. And then probably as important as anything, Christ himself supported the historical accuracy of the book. Look at Matthew 12, 39 to 41. Jesus answered them. Remember what they did? They said, give us a sign so that we may believe. And he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Or just as Jonah was, in, was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Here's where you get into, if, you, if you're studying historical data. If Jesus did not know that Jonah was not a historical prophet, why does he speak in the language he does as if he is referencing a historical event? Jesus quoted Matthew, I think, seals beyond dispute. Jonah was historical, actually preached to Nineveh, and that great revival actually took place. Jesus says so. and says the fact of it will rise up and condemn those Pharisees, Sadducees that were constantly badgering him. He said the only sign you're going to get has already been given. By the way, let me say parenthetically, this is a, this is a good thing for us to remember. We all have friends who are in connections, religious connections, where, where signs and wonders, signs and wonders, signs and wonders always being produced as, as if this, this validates and that validates. Chasing for a sign. Look, we need to remember Jesus said to continue looking for a sign to validate him puts you in the category of, of an evil and adulterous generation. You've been given the only sign you're going to be given and you better believe it. That as, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days, three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. So that's what, when you put all this together, that's where you realize Jonah died in that fish and was brought back to life through the work of God, just as Jesus would die and be raised from the dead, uh, triumphant from the work he had done. Well, in terms of the date, uh, I'll just kind of give you some things that were happening that, that sort of pinpointed around 760 B.C. Just real quickly, the repentance of Nineveh probably occurred in the reign of, of Ashurdan III, this, uh, the, the king of, of Nineveh. 773 to 755 was his reign, so 760 puts it in the middle of it. There were two plagues that came upon the, uh, the people around that, that same time. And then there was a solar eclipse that took place in 763 B.C., all of these things, the, uh, the plagues, the, the darkening of the sun, which, which these peoples took with great uh, trepidation, may well have been used much like the plagues in Egypt to prepare the people of Nineveh for the message. In other words, if they had experienced those cataclysmic events, then for someone to come among them from, from uh, Yahweh Elohim to say, 40 days and you'll be overthrown. It would have been a sort of a preparatory work in their lives. And so that's why the, the, uh, we piece that together. It's about a 760 B.C. date. As far as the theme of it, the purpose of it, you see the power of God in nature and the mercy of God in human affairs. Uh, his, sovereign, his sovereignty and his mercy. He has all power, could have well destroyed uh, along the way, any and all of the, of the players in this drama. Yet in his sovereignty, he spared and he showed great mercy. He's sovereign over the wind and the waves at the sea. He is sovereign over the east wind that, that, that withers the, the tree. He's sovereign over the plant that grew up in a, in a quick, un, uh, t untimely way. Um, but in the midst of all that sovereignty, he shows he is full of mercy. He is full of mercy. It's not bare power. It's not raw power. 
But in the book of Jonah, you see something that I'm reminded of my friend David Sitton, uh, when he taught a series of, of sermons years ago, before when we brought him here, after we came here, um, said that pagan cultures are not impressed by arguments. Pagan cultures are impressed by power. These pagan sailors on this ship, you see how quickly they turned. They were praying to their gods. Not everybody's here, they said. They went down and found Jonah. What are you doing sleeping? Pray to your God. What's going on? And so he introduces himself as a follower of Yahweh Elohim. And when he prays, they take him and throw him over in the sea. Come still. Power. Power impressed them. So the theme and purpose is the, is the sovereignty of God and the mercy of God. The keys, of course, the key phrase would be revival in Nineveh. It's the, it's the only prophecy in the Old Testament, the only prophetic book in the Old Testament, where revival is the response. Sadly, the response of the prophet to that is not admirable. Key verses we read, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, chapter 4, verse 2. The key chapter is chapter 3, uh, because it records the revival, the great movement of God, the, the turning of the people's hearts. So you see that uh, the entire nation comes to believe in God, proclaims a fast, and cries out to this God that they've just met. Well, what about Jesus? Where do we see him? Jonah is the only prophet, think about this now, whom Jesus likened to himself. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. Jesus acknowledges the prophets, quotes the prophets, but only in this situation does Jesus liken what Jonah experienced, not Jonah's character, what Jonah experienced, to what Jesus would experience in his death, burial, and resurrection. Of course, we read it a while ago, Matthew 12, 39 to, to 41. Just look at verse 40. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah is a type, and it's in a strange sort of way, because don't, don't mistake this now, not the character of Jonah, not the bigotry of Jonah, but, the, but, but God's movement upon him and God's use of him. He is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. And of course, he's also a type in that death, burial, and resurrection, uh, primarily. So, so you see foreshadowed, Jesus points back to it, says, you want a sign? It's already been given. Study what happened to Jonah. It's about to happen to me. So how does it contribute to the Bible? Well, as I said at the outset, its emphasis is completely different from every other Old Testament prophetic book. We've gone through prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. You can study the prophecies of Jonah in about 10 seconds. You get 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now you can dig into that, understand what it means, but you've covered the uh, sum and substance of his preaching as recorded in the Old Testament. This is a character study of the prophet, of the messenger. As I said earlier, I think that his prophecy only contains in the Hebrew five words. There are 48 verses in Jonah. Five of them concern a prophetic message. 43 run the gamut of the life and the emotions of Jonah as a prophet. The only one in all the prophets we study sent directly to the Gentiles. The only one, best we can tell from studying, who didn't want to preach his message, the reluctant prophet, preached it begrudgingly. So you learn some things from a book like this. First of all, it's, it's impossible to succeed in running away from God. Maybe you've never done that. I've dealt with people through the years, we've heard people share their testimony, and they, you know, I fought this, I fought that, and finally the Lord subdued them. Second thing is there's no limit to what God can use to get one's attention. He's, 
He had, the, he had the winds and the waves at his disposal. He had a great fish prepared. God is sovereign. He owns it all. And he is not limited in his means to accomplish his purpose. He's chosen to accomplish it through human vessels speaking as ambassadors for him. But there's no limit to the means at his disposal. Good news for us in Jonah is that failure does not disqualify a person from God's service. This is blatant disobedience on Jonah's part. It would have been, if we were writing the story, we'd have said, enough of you. We'll go find somebody else. No. Failure does not disqualify a person from being used by God. Fourth, disobedience to God creates turmoil in the life of a believer. It's, it's good. So if you're going through some things, struggle after struggle after struggle, uh, lack of peace, lack of peace, stop and, and ask yourselves. Do an evaluation. Do, a, do an inventory. Am I being disobedient to God in an area in my life that he's going to just continue to trouble my conscience, trouble my, my providences, my circumstances until I come face to face with him, cast myself upon him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Cleanse me from my iniquities. Help me to find re rest and peace and hope in you and stop kicking against your providences. He told Saul on the road to Damascus, it's hard to kick against the, against the pricks or against the goads. And a, 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 par, a, a paraphrase of that is, you will break your toe if you keep kicking against me. You will not succeed in this. And he subdued him right there. Here's an important one for us, I think. Now, all these are important, but here's, patriotism should never stand between a believer and the plan of God. I've said to you for years, I want to be known. And when I say these things, don't misunderstand me. I thank God for the country we live in. It's the greatest country on the face of the earth. We have more liberties, more freedoms than any other place on the face of the earth so far. So we thank God for that, for the blessings of God upon America. But we need to intentionally be Christ followers who happen, by God's providence, to be Americans, rather than to be Americans who happen to be Christians. You flip that around, that's a, it's easy to become a narrow, as the term was used in the, in the notes, a narrow nationalist like Jonah, and to look down upon people who are not Americans. I told you before, I had a worldview at one time in my life. To, to add to the, the fuzziness of the bigotry that I was raised in, I had a worldview that was about the, 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 the circumference of an empty paper towel tube. If it wasn't happening within this view, then it wasn't happening. And I was lamenting one day, just lamenting that we haven't seen revival. And, and my friend that I met, Errol Hulse, who's gone to be with the Lord, came over from England, spending some time with us. He began to school me. He was the first person I ever sat down with, the first, what I would call, global Christian. He began to tell me what was going on in this country, how Christians were persecuted there, how the gospel was advancing where they were persecuted. And then this other country, he went over and over and over. And I just began to be rebuked. I was thinking, because it wasn't happening in my field of view, it couldn't have been happening. I mean, I live in America after all. And I've heard people talk about the end times. My ears perked up. People talk about the end times in terms of when things really get bad in America, then the Lord's going to come and take us all out of this. Well, they're really bad for Christians around the world, have been for about 2,000 years now. And it's a, it's a narrow nationalism. It's, a, it's an unfounded emphasis. We are, we are citizens of two places, citizens of this country and citizens of another country that we're headed toward. And we need to keep that balanced. Jonah is a warning to us. 
Zane Pratt, who's preached in this pulpit and was a great leader, is a great leader at the International Mission Board, said he was serving in South Central Asia, Southeast Asia. And on 9-11, when the Twin Towers were attacked, the International Mission Board began to get phone calls from churches, pastors, parents, wanting to know, first of all, were their members or their, their sons and daughters who were in Muslim countries, were they safe, number one? What was the IMB going to do to protect them? And he said, but the, but the request, he said, that was, that was for information. The request was, pull them out of those countries now. These people are animals and do not deserve to hear the gospel if they would do that to our country. Zane said it just broke their hearts at the board. It really revealed something lacking about the support at home for the folks that were laying down their lives in the mission field. So I think Jonah serves as a warning to us. It checks me all the time. I, brothers and sisters, I'd love to tell you, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that bigotry anymore, but there's, there's nonsense that happens in this nation by leaders speaking on behalf of other peoples, peoples from that, those areas speaking, and it, it just drives me to distraction sometimes. I have to fight against it. Because that, that, that bigotry wells up in me, and I've got to slay that. I've got, to, I've got to remind myself, I am a Christian who in God's wonderful providence happens to live here. I am not an American who simply happens to be a Christian. Patriotism should never stand between a believer and the plan of God. This book shows us God's heart for all kinds of people. He intends to save all kinds of people from every tongue and tribe and nation and language. It would be obvious to you now one of the reasons that every year we go through the top 50 countries where it's hard to be a Christian, where there's persecution, is so that you don't live as ignorantly as I lived after seminary serving in a church before I became aware of the advance of the gospel around the world and the need of the gospel. It's interesting that Nineveh responded better to the preaching of Jonah than Israel and Judah ever responded to the preaching of any of the prophets. So that's take a look at this amazing prophetic book and what we can learn about it. I can study how God dealt with Jonah's anger, with his bigotry. Good lessons for us. Test yourself. Do I want the nations to come to Christ? If you find in there... No, I don't. Then repent of that and ask the Lord to enlarge your heart, to make your heart like his heart. See men and women and boys and girls not the color of their skin, not even for the content of their character, but to see them as people made in the image of God who need a Savior. Jesus Christ is the only hope they have. Questions or comments or observations before we wrap this up?